I'm nothing without my PowerPoint. That's, I think, the problem. Um, okay. Yeah, so, yeah, happy to talk about uh, all that. Um, we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about what I've been calling job seeking as self-presentation. And if you think about how Don framed the, his talk around how employers can improve how they select and the uh, biases and, and problems with that, this is going to look at the employee and the applicant and how they vary and how, they, uh, how, how we think or how I've been thinking about how they apply and how that affects whether they get hired or not and, and outcomes. So it's kind of like flipping it, the, the coin and looking at the other side of it. Um, we're going to approach it with a, uh, as, as um, Greg mentioned, a linguistic text analysis methodology. So some of the questions that came up at the very end of Don's talk about, you know, why don't we, aren't, why aren't we better or why don't we try to think about um, um, systematizing how you interview and, and the things you elicit from that. This actually, I think, brings a little bit of structure to that question. And so as um, Greg also suggested, the challenge with text analysis is that it's incredibly unstructured text. So for example, at a job interview, you can say anything, right? And so how do you organize and structure that and think about it? Um, we'll give you hopefully some hints about that today as well. Before I get there, how I started. So um, just a really brief synopsis. Again, I, like I said, I think I literally know most of you um, from leading people. So this is probably a review. But um, so I, I have an MBA from Chicago and I have a PhD from Stanford. And I've always been interested in questions about um, hiring, how people get jobs. And so one of the biggest data sets I've been working with is this Elance, which is merged with Odesk and became Upwork. Um, they have an amazing amount of data on hiring um, over time. And so we'll get into what that means. But this is one of the bigger companies I've been working with, as well as consulting with Google and Intel and some startups as well, and including Lauren's company. So but we can talk about that offline. <laughs> so let's get back to the topic of today. I'm going to spend, I guess, half an hour or so talking about text analysis in the hiring domain. I welcome any questions you have along the way. This is relatively new work. This is definitely cutting edge. There's no right answer to this yet, which is, I think, really cool, because you can think about ways of doing things that people haven't even thought about doing in the first place, um, which is what's exciting about this for me. Okay. Um, so this is, oh, just b before I get too far ahead, this is co-authored work with a PhD student of mine, Wei Yi, um, who's uh, graduated this, this past year in, um, from the PhD program here, and will be going back to Singapore and, uh, and getting a professorship there. Okay? So let's think about hiring. Okay, let's think about hiring. And I would say that to start off, you can think about hiring as basically being judged, right? Ultimately, the employer, as we've talked about earlier with Don, is, is judging the applicant on lots of different features. And they're literally going to hire you or not hire you based off of how they interpret the information you give them. Okay. So what do I mean by that? Right? How, what are you being judged on? Okay. I'm going to break down kind of this job seeking interaction to its basic components, which if you think about it is literally there's the applicant, there's the employer that you're trying to convince to hire you, and there's the job that you're applying for. Right? So at a very, very basic level, there are these three components to think about. And as I mentioned, the way we're going to think about it today in the next half hour is to think about from the job applicant's perspective, how do they kind of apply? What do they present? How do they address these issues when they're in that hiring interaction? Right. Simply put, if you think about it, you either have to convince the employer to hire you at some level and that you're suitable for the job or task at hand. Right? So again, the very basic components of a job seeking interaction basically involve you as a job seeker, whoever the job seeker is, convincing the employer to hire them and also that you're suitable for the task. Right? So employers right, are looking to answer two questions at least. One is, can the applicant do the job? Are they up for the task? And second is, do I want this person to do the job? Right? Oftentimes, people neglect that part of it. Right? A lot of people, a lot of MBAs, a lot of undergrads come to me and they're like, why didn't I get the job? My GPA is 4.0. I have 1,600 on my GMATs or SATs or whatever, whatever the score is now. Right? I have all these kind of concrete, objective measures that Don talked about being important. Why didn't I get the job? I think you neglect the fact, or a lot of people neglect the fact, that they're also there to convince the employer that they should hire them, that there is a fit, that there is some reason why orthogonal to any uh, ability or skill or education that they should want you. So how I think about this is applicants need to be able to do the job, obviously. 
that's not the issue, right? You have ability and skill, you have grades, you have a school that you graduated from, classes you've taken, the experience that you've had that are, is relevant. Can you do the job? On the other hand, you also need to think about why the employer would want you to do the job. Why you? If you guys get on an interview list with these desirable companies, you're all coming from Haas with an MBA, probably with great grade point averages, probably taken my class and Greg's class. You're all pretty equal. Beyond that, you know, maybe there are nuances to the experiences you've had, the interests you have. But ultimately, what is it about you that you can convince the employer to want you? Right? This, I'm going to suggest, is more about liking. Again. This is why I came after Don, because I think he set this up already, right? You've heard of the airport test for consultant. So I did consulting for about seven years of my life. And in the interview, there's what we call the airport test, which is you sitting there, say you have a layover, two hours in the airport with this person that you're interviewing. Is this person someone that I want to get stuck at the airport with for two hours on a layover, on a delay, on a flight delay, right? Does that have anything to do with your GPA? Does that have anything to do with the school you went to? No. I'm going to suggest no. It has a lot more to do with having similar interests, being more attractive, <laughs> things like that. OK. So now that I've kind of broken out this job seeking interaction into thinking about the task and convincing someone that you can do it versus the employer and convincing them they'll like you, want you, want you to do it. All right. I'm going to say there's two dimensions to how a job seeker can present themselves, either relationally okay, or transactionally. Right. I'm sticking these two up here because I realize, or at least I think of them as two separate poles, right, uh, two separate ends of a spectrum. Right. On the one hand, relational, I've colored it red for a reason, it's about warmth, it's about convincing someone they should like you. Versus transactional, it's blue, right? It's cold, it's about doing the job, it's about doing the work. Oftentimes, most of the research that suggests, you know, looking at people perception, looking at social perception, that these two are kind of opposite ends of the spectrum. There are nuances to this, and I'm happy to talk about it, right? There are situations where obviously both apply, one more applies more than the other, right? But I'm just gonna stick out there that there are these two poles that you can think about when you're applying to a job. All right, so let's unpack it a teeny bit more. Relational presentation, this is when you get into a, you know, whether it's an interview or an email you send them or some, you know, after interview, you send them in a follow up. What do you talk about? Well, you can talk about the interviewer, you know, the person you met with. You can talk about being excited about working with them. You can be friendlier versus not. These are things that you may not think about that people, when they apply, vary on these dimensions. All right. Most of you have gotten to a point where you've probably interviewed people at least, right? You can think about how people vary and how they, how friendly they are, how interactive they are about you and finding out common interests and common ground. Okay. This is the relational aspect of seeking a job. On the other hand, you can spend your time talking about the job itself. You know, how the classes you've taken and the experiences you've had at Haas apply so uniquely to this position and why you've that 4.0 you got in your programming class makes you the best person that they should hire. Right? Talking about you know, wages, what kinds of you know, responsibilities will I have? How much am I going to be paid? The dynamics of the job itself. Right? So if you start thinking about it, seeking a job, people vary a lot on these dimensions, on how one approaches and presents themselves in getting a job. Okay? So, Given this kind of conceptual setup, what we're going to do is we're going to ask three questions. Right? And this is where it kind of gets interesting because I've set this up and it's like, well, yeah, but how are you going to measure that? How are you going to link that with being hired or not? Okay. First, we're going to ask the question, do applicants actually vary on this relational transactional spectrum that I've set up? Right. How are we going to figure out variation on this? Right. Manju's like, yes, definitely. Right. But we have to be able to quantify it. Okay. 
second? If that's the case, then who's more likely to be hired? And under what conditions? Okay. And then finally, and this is actually an interesting component to it too, right? It's an implication of it. It's, so given that people may vary in how they act when they kind of seek a job, sure, it may affect who gets hired and under what conditions, but does it also affect how they're evaluated after the fact? How well do they work on the job? And this is where it starts getting a little interesting because you can think a little bit about, well, it's again, this is two sides of the same coin, right? Getting the job and also hiring someone knowing that they're trying to get the job. And what does that mean to kind of eventual outcomes? Okay. Questions so far? I feel like I'm moving pretty fast. So in the first yeah. question, you mean predict their performance? Exactly. So after the, so we're going to look at a setting whereby it's going to be uh, one-off temporary gigs. And then I have feedback on how well they did after that job. So it's literally, you know, you have this bounded task in which you get evaluated on. And I'm going to look at outcomes on that. So, so the question, so does it predict their performance evaluation? Because yeah. another interesting question could be whether or not there's a, a wedge between performance and performance evaluation based on these different presentations. That's right. So one, one could imagine that if you were to focus on the relational, mm -hmm. then, you know, you may wind up um, seeing performance evaluations drift away from, yeah. from performance. That's right. That's right. So this is actually part of, I think, the, the wedge that Don is using to make a case for, if you look at test scores, those people are going to, higher test scores are going to end up having higher, better results, right? Then the question becomes, how objective are those results? How, um, how much those results depend on getting other people to back your ideas and things like that, right? So it becomes a little more nuanced than that. Absolutely. Yeah. So um, we can talk a little bit about that when I get to the results, but you can definitely think about this as, you know, there are these two spectrums and you can imagine some mattering more than others depending on the type of job, right? Yeah. I don't get into that in, that, in terms of analyses, but we can obviously, we can speculate on that a little more. Okay. All right. So we're going to look online, right? We're going to look at hiring as judging online. Now, part of the reason is for data because we, I have access to this data, but part of it is real as well, right? I think job seeking is quickly moving online. So not only is your identity and how you interact with companies kind of being mediated by the internet, but people are getting jobs directly through the internet as well, right? In terms of whether it's temporary work, in terms of having identity out there on LinkedIn, right? Thinking about how one interacts with a company, the first kind of line is oftentimes virtual. And what I'm going to get at is, let's think about this from this kind of internet text enabled, right, uh, mediator, okay? Emails, obviously, the first time you get in touch with people, oftentimes it's either an email that you write, your online profiles that you have out there, or even the web-based application systems, right? So all this suggests there's a lot of text out there in which you need to think about what you're writing and how an employer is viewing what you're writing. Right. So I'm going to look at our, I'm going to describe a little bit more about the setting specifically, right? but we're going to be looking at kind of job seeking online. This is data from Elance, which has since merged with Odesk and become Upwork. Are most of you, I, I'll spend time talking a little bit about it. So basically this is a, a platform for temporary gig employment that's, that's completely virtual. So if you need anything done, that can be done virtually. Right? Whether that's like getting a logo design, getting a website program, you know, getting something edited. You can get on this platform, post a job, and people from all over the world will apply, freelancers, right, to your job. And then you can hire them virtually, you can get them you know, working virtually, you pay them virtually, everything's done kind of on this platform. Okay? What's interesting is this is getting pretty big. I think the last time I checked in with them, they were doing over a billion dollars in jobs a year um, and so it's it's kind of it's, it's pretty substantial and what's nice is it, it, it varies in the type of work like you can imagine any type of work being done virtually is being done on this platform now okay so we have data from this platform this is what it looks like employers as I said get online and post a job this is a logo and business card design job right there's some general information about the job itself and then someone right you, you describe kind of what you need done you post a job and then freelancers apply kind of from all over the world. And this is what it looks like when they apply. 
you have photo, uh, kind of a name, and then where they're from, some specifications on their ability. And for our sake, what's most interesting is you can write a paragraph or two right, trying to convince the employer that they should hire you. This is cool. Not only is there the general kind of resume stuff that you can look at, what their ratings are, what kind of jobs they've done in the past, but there's this free form text whereby you write something to kind of convince someone to hire you. This is kind of, this is, keep this in mind because this is what we're going to exploit when we move forward. Yeah, no. Are you thinking that this translates to somebody looking for a full-time job? It just seems like when I'm hiring somebody, I might hire somebody for, you know, years on end and hiring for potential rather than for actual skills that they've proven to have in the past. Yes, so great point, right? This is not the same as hiring for a full-time job because I think there are a lot of other considerations. So for example, hiring into companies, it's not just the employer and the task, but there's like a culture around the company as well. And you can also imagine the task isn't just what they're doing that day, but also for years on end. So there are other dynamics to consider. Um, however, I think you, you'll be Maybe surprised at the findings, given how you framed it, because I think the way you're thinking of it is then you should think that it's just about the task and not as much about the employer, right? So we'll, we'll, we'll get to that. But yeah, absolutely. This is um, the way I'm approaching this is general enough. The findings themselves are obviously going to be more specific to this setting. Yeah. yeah, but we can think about how it applies or not. Did you also look at the, the pictures and some of the other uh, features? <laughs> uh, you know, we know, we know that those yeah. are hugely impactful in, yeah. in, in the marketing setting. Yeah, so uh, a great point, right? So the, simply put, you can see there's a photo there. The photo has a gender attached to it as well as some level of attractiveness as well as other things such as you can imagine professionalism and things like that. Um, for our purposes, empirically, we're just going to control for that by doing kind of analyses within person. So it's like the same person applying over time. Um, but there's absolutely a lot of interesting stuff here. So I have another paper on gender that, that I'm happy to talk about. Um, and then we're also coding in another platform um, race, gender, and attractiveness, but also professionalism and all these other things, um, which I'm happy to talk about when we get there. But you can imagine there's a lot we can do with that. And advances in computer vision allow us to actually code photos the same way you code text with actual like characteristics and features of the photo. So is this person wearing sunglasses or not can be picked up by a computer vision machine learning algorithm, in which case then it gets really cool, right? Because you can start saying stuff like, here are, are 10,000 photos, computer. Tell me which ones are professional or not. So they can make yeah. I yeah. know they yeah. can do you know, beauty and... and uh, Smiling, a lot of things. Yeah. And so Age, yeah. yeah, yeah. We can talk more about that when we get there, yeah. There's a whole, there's a whole another domain with photos. We're going to talk about text today, but yeah, I'm happy to talk about that. Okay. All right. So this is the setting. So as I mentioned, you will, these app freelancers apply and they write this text and then someone gets hired. And what we're going to do is look at, again, these three questions, but now more specific to kind of the setting, right? So first, given that people are writing these job proposals, is there a variation in how they write these job proposals? And how does that vary? I've already given you a clue as to how we're going to be thinking about it. So we're going to see if we can unpack that more systematically with the text here. Second is, given what people write, does it affect whether they get hired or not and under kind of what conditions? And of course, we'll, I'll explain a little bit of this more. And then finally, what's interesting in this setting is we have kind of the ultimate feedback they get from the employer. So we can actually circle back and say, given who got hired and what they wrote, what kind of ratings they got. Right. Yeah, please, TJ. control for the, the task type mm -hmm. or, you know, the uh, the price that they're quoting. Mm -hmm. How do you control for this? So the simple answer is we control f with it in a reg regression. And so we run what we call um, within job category fixed effects. So uh, if I mentioned logo design as a type of job people do. Right? So I take all the logo design jobs and I look at how people vary within logo design. So basically they're all vying for the same type of job but varying kind of how they write. Does that make sense? Uh, but, but, but they could be uh, getting different prices. Uh, yep, and so we control for price as well. Yeah. 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 Okay. Good. So, same three questions, but now kind of more specific to this setting. Okay? So, what are we talking about data wise? We are talking about, about, this is a little bit more than the year of data. And the reason we picked this is this is the most kind of recent full year of nice, rich data we have. Um, this is 3.8 million job postings. So, this is 
3.8 million jobs that have posted online. 228,000 freelancers have applied to these. No, I'm sorry, 3.8 million job proposals, right? These are applications, okay? From 228,000 freelancers for 280,000 jobs posted by 117,000 employers, right? So just the takeaway here is there's a lot of data, right? a lot of variation. When we pull out all the words people wrote, so if you recall, I mean, we, we literally took all the words people wrote and took it out of their job proposals, out of 3.8 million job proposals, right? There are about almost 900,000, about 850,000 unique words. Yeah, come out, yeah. Strange, right? I mean, making up new words. Exactly, <laughs> right? We know that basically you need like 2,000 words to read the New York Times, right? So why is there, okay, so part of this is acronyms, part of this is misspellings, part of it is exactly what you're getting at, abbreviations, exact, a bunch of trash, yeah. My massively long tail is the easy way to explain it. Travis, yeah, question? Oh, no, 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 you're good, okay. Oh, yeah, oh, please, please, yeah, no name tag. Yeah, 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 no, tons of stuff. Absolutely, tons of stuff. Okay. Uh, are all the proposals in English or are there any translations or good good point, good point. So the the simple answer is they're all they're all in English. Yeah. Which also means poor English, right? Yeah. 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 Yeah, 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 that's right. I, I would screen out people basically if they had that English. Yeah. And I, this might be where you're going, but that, yeah. I don't know if I should have been doing that, but that I value people who can mm -hmm. use the English language well, but that mm -hmm. doesn't necessarily mean they're more than they Yeah, yeah. No, no, no. That's right. So, um,. We don't spend too much time on that, uh, but let's think about how we operationalize this because I think it's le slightly less of an issue, for ex and, and I'll, ex I'll explain why. So the challenge, as, as Greg kind of previewed and as we've been building, is this text is completely unstructured, right? So Carol, as we saw, wrote this text, and how do we figure out what she's getting at? Mechanically, right? Sure, we can read it and infer what we want from it, and we can measure it, kind of with ratings of one to seven or something like that, but that's just not practical given the volume we have, right? So what do we do with all this text? And as I said, it's like 859,000 unique words, right? Okay, you have an answer. Uh, no, I, I, <laughs> you, you still just have to categorize it into two, right? Relational and transactional, right? That's all, yeah. Right. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we'll see how we do it and see if it's convincing enough. All right, okay, so as I said, we have a lot of, Freaking words. Now, um, what we do is we, first of all, we stem the words. So H-A-P-P-I actually ends up being spelled correctly because happy, H-A-P-P, -P, some vowel is, is all happiness, happy, happiest, is all considered one type of word. So we're going to stem them. What happens is that ends up with a gigantic, still a gigantic cluster of words. What, what we do is we look at basically the 5,000 most common words, which which is why you guys had funny faces on when I said 859 unique words because that's pretty much 97 and a half percent of all the words used, right? So, okay. What we do is we now have 3.8 million job postings, right? Each of them is a row in our data set. We have 5,000 unique words. That's a column, okay? This is what the data set load data look like. And then for each of those job postings, we have the number of times one of those words shows up in that job posting. Okay, you get the structure of the data now? Okay. What that allows us to do is make this a lot more manageable. So basically, the strategy here is called dimensional reduc it's a reduction. It's dimensionality reduction, right, is what we're doing. All right. Otherwise, we have 3.8 million by 859,000, and nothing can run that very easily. So now we have 3.8 million by 5,000, and the cells in that matrix are zeros and ones and twos. They're basically numbers of times that those 5,000 words show up in the job proposal, right? So what do you do with that? Oh, actually, this is, this is the page where I explained what I just said. Okay, so we took the words, we crushed them down, we took the 5,000 top words, we coded them for each of the job proposals, and then we further reduced the dimensionality by coding those 5,000 words into one of 52 Luke categories. I'll explain what that is in a second, okay? And then what we did was we took those 52 dimensional dimensions of Luke categories and ran a principal component analysis. All right, this is a very high level slide. I'll go into detail so that way you can get a sense for what we're doing in terms of text analysis. Okay, so Luke categories. 
What are LUC categories? LUC, L-I-W-C, stands for Linguistic Inquiry Word Count. It's a terrible acronym. There's a social, a social psychologist at UT Austin named Penna Baker, and he's been working on this for a long, long time. It's really cool because he's been doing this before, like text was cool, and now it's like suddenly it's, 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 it's on fire. But basically, what's going on is him and his team have been working on trying to categorize words into what you're talking about when you use those words. So when you use words such as family, I mean, such as daughter and husband or aunt, you're probably talking about family. When you use words such as think, know, and consider, we're calling these insight type words. Right? So we have 52 categories of, categories of psycholinguistic constructs to try and identify what people are talking about. So we've gone from 859,000 words to 600,000 if you take away kind of the obvious misspellings to 5,000 if you just look at the most common to 52 dimensions of words. So now we're dealing with something we can kind of work with, right? Because we're saying every one of those 3.8 million job proposals, they're talking about some of these 52 categories of psycholinguistic constructs, All right? Does that make sense? So this is how, yeah. Do no. you keep the weights? To so uh, we do weight it by loop category. So if you recall, oops, I'm going the wrong way. Uh, intensity, yeah, the intensity does matter, yeah. So like if you say happy like 36 times, like you're really happy, right? yeah. <laughs> um, there's ways to do this otherwise, right? And there's also, um, so, and also, so I guess I'll, I'll stop here for a second and just comment a little bit more about this text, text analysis because I think it's like I don't want to say this is the way to do it go and do this because there's a lot of considerations that are involved in this and there's lots of choices you need to make so one example is exactly what Noe's getting at like if you say happy 13 times does that mean you're 13 times happier than the person that said happy once we're gonna make the assumption yes but you can imagine also no right there maybe you're just crazy or or maybe you're repeating yourself right um, you can also argue that it's just not single words that matter the combinations of words, so not happy means something very different than happy. And so there's, right now, we're just assuming single words, but you can also construct bigrams and full sentences and, and kind of elicit what that means out of that as well. You can imagine the complexity just builds from, from here, right? This is just like the simplest way to think about it is a bag of words. TJ. What about uh, the length of the text or the sophistication of the actual language and things like that? Yes. That is great. Um, we have some very preliminary analyses, which we're not going to talk about today, which does look at that. So what you're getting at is it's not just what you're writing about, right? but how, how you write it, how complex your sentences are, how many syllables the words you use are, um, even things like how many articles you use suggests a different way of thinking than, than, than um, depending on how, like the variety of, uh, of words you use. So there's lots of ways at this. Again, we're just taking the simplest, which is the words you wrote. But once you get into this kind of analysis, you, there are lots of different ways you can go, and most of that's driven by what you want to figure out. Right? So if you want to figure out, like, are people inferring how smart they are from the complexity of the vocabulary and the sentences they use, we could do something like that. We, we, we just happen to not in this. Just an example, at my work, we always uh, get a your writing sample, mm -hmm. because uh, it's important to know how to write. Uh, and so yeah, yeah. We get the right example, but you know, we don't do any textual analysis, but we look through. Let's do some textual analysis. <laughs> I've been looking for a situation where people actually write more. Like, so this situation is somewhat unique, as as Noe pointed out, right? Like, how many how many times are people applying online and have a paragraph to write? But there are situations whereby people ask for writing samples. Um, I, I, in fact, I one of the things I've been doing with another company is we're thinking of putting in like literally a writing sample into the job application process and do exactly this with it because from free text you can infer a lot of a lot more things than just this right um, we can talk about that more once you get the analysis okay so here are some examples of what we're talking about if you're it's the, these are what are considered social words so we've categorized the words people are using as social words here so you your hello versus work words Right, work, obviously, company, project, service. Right, you get it, right? There's kind of variation in the types of words that people are using. Now, the question becomes, 
what's the pattern of variation in the words that people are using. Is this your coding scheme? No, this is, um, oh, 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 this is, yes, we'll get there. Yeah, yeah, no, that's right. So right now, up to this point, we just have the words coded by Luke category. And so right now it's completely out of our hands in terms of we're not inf inf inferring anything from what they've written or, 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 or <laughs> making any judgments as to what, um, how the Luke categories play out. This is when kind of the magic happens, right? So we have 3.8 million job proposals by 52 dim Luke dimensions, okay? Then the question becomes, what do, you, what do you do with that, right? And principal component analysis is a technique to further reduce text and things in, in, in terms of their dimensionality. And so what, quite simply, I, I'll keep it at a high level here, what it does is it looks for the most negatively correlated categories that we just coded. So when someone writes this type of word, like they're talking about death or whatever, they're definitely not going to be talking about happiness. However, when they write words about happiness, they're definitely not going to be talking about death, right? So that's an example of what this PCA does. It tries to look for the most negatively correlated words that people are using in these job proposals. And the reason you want to do this is because you want to figure out like what differs among what people are writing in these job proposals, right? How do people vary in how people, in what they write? So we took these 52 dimensions, we, we ran a principal component analysis, and this is what we ended up with, okay. In one group of words, people are using what we call relational words. And this is, again, the parallel to how we started or how I started this talk is relational versus transactional, right? So these are social words, words that are positive emotion, words that, in, um, that have to do with being together, and words that have to do with um, 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 what's the other one? Togetherness, family. Well, we'll, we'll get there because I have more detail about this. Okay. Yeah, well, when, you do a, when you do a PCA, you don't know exactly how it's going to turn out. So, no, right. did you decide on these two categories after you did the PCA, or did you just fortuitously get the, the PCA to, to, to crank out the two dimensions that you intuitively thought that things would? Sort yeah, of yeah, no. Um, so it's it's it both. I would say the PCA led us. Obviously, we're going to be limited by the findings we have, and so in the sense that was the what what led us to this. Because you're right, and this is exactly what's interesting about text analysis. This is exploratory. Like you could not know anything and run this, and just see what you come up with, and then kind of backward induct what that means, um, which is partly what we did. However, the dichotomy between relational and transactional those are our terms. The Actual social psychological research suggests that there is some very there's some kind of universal difference between how people are perceived that vary between what they call warmth and competence. You've heard that version of it. There's other versions of this that all map onto this. So basically, like since Ash in 1950s, right? Social psychologists have pretty much believed that people are perceived as being either warm or being kind of competent which matches on kind of very well to this relation. So kind of both ways. We're finding, we're basically finding what we should expect. Yeah, Max. When you described the PCA component part of it, you used death and happiness. Yeah, yeah. Um, so you're saying, yeah. but these are job proposals, so you're going to have a lot of variety coming in just by the nature of what the text is coming from. So are these mm -hmm. the, is this what, and I guess this was part of the question too, is this the mm -hmm. output or? I'm just struggling to find yep. the, how it's going to work, PCA, how it's going to work mm -hmm. without the variety. Yeah, so, so uh, let's see. So the first question is, yes, absolutely. There's Of the 52 categories, people just aren't going to be talking about death in when they're writing for a job, right? Unless it's something specific to <laughs> some kind of job, but, the, <laughs> but not, not in this case. So, so there's less variation in, 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 it's not just 52, it's probably more like 30 something or 40 something, right? Um, Within that, we, we still get variation, and so I'll tell you what that is. I probably should have flipped these slides, but what's going on is um, we are getting kind of a negative correlation among different types of categories of, of, um, of words, and so this is what it is, right? So on one hand, you have people talking about people using pronouns, people using social words, people using words that have to do with affect, which is like feeling, people that are using proper pronouns, and people using positive emotional words and words related to you, right? And if you can get any smaller, the font's too little, but there's words about togetherness and things like that here. So 
what this kind of principal component analysis is spitting out is when people apply to jobs on this platform, people use these types of words, and they don't use those types of words, which I'll get to in a second. And when they use those types of words, they don't use these types of words. Yeah, so there is actually natural variation along kind of how we've been thinking about this, which is relational versus transactional. On the other hand, you can use words that are and mechanical. So this has to do with literally like words like thinking and doing. Relativity, which has to do with scheduling. Right? Like, I can do it within four days or something like that. Uh, space words, obviously. Work words, time words, achievement words, quantitative words. And so you can see people vary in what they're writing about. And on one hand, they're writing what we think is about the job, about the task, about the timing and schedule and pay. And on the other hand, people are writing about the person, about the social relationships, about working with them. That's the variation we're getting. Yes, please, Aaron. Postings and do people tailor their language based on what the actual post is asking for? So, if a post is one or the other, mm -hmm. will they tailor it to be more relevant? Yeah, good question. So, um, this is completely. Uh, ignorant of what people are applying to. This is a variation on the whole platform, so all 3.8 million job postings. Um, we, interestingly enough, we do even if we do within kind of job posting, there's still variation in how people apply, which is kind of more indicative of the fact that I think people just aren't sure. You know, I don't think we have any priors as to how we should apply and what we should emphasize or not. Yeah, so we still get variation not only within people applying for a job, but within a person applying over time as well. Yeah. Um, uh, okay. Anything else? So, just to kind of finish this off, the, each dot here is one of the job proposals, like 3.8 million of them. And this is a measurement of kind of how transactional you are. This is a measurement of how relational you are, and the negative correlation looks, now it's pretty stark, right? Now, of course, there's some big bubble in between about people writing a little bit about each. But the fact that you get this kind of nice variation along the spectrum is, is interesting, we think. Okay. So we've gotten to the point where we've boiled down all these job applications into what people are writing. And then now the question becomes, well, here, here let me show you some examples. Maybe, maybe that's a better idea. Okay. So this is coded in red. It's relational. This is a type of kind of text that people are writing when we've measured it to be more relational than not. Hello and greetings. Thank you. Uh, for the opportunity to submit to bid for your project, I have studied your requirements and I can make all 100 banners and buttons, resize them. Pleasure for me to get an opportunity to serve you. Thank you. Right? There's a little bit about the job, but there's a lot about working with the person and kind of making sure the person either trusts them or likes them. Yeah, Joe. How high does that relational, or how high does the score go? Like, what's that? Yeah. Uh, so there's super, there are a few outliers, but this. 2.2 is standard deviations from the from the mean, and so this is with this is like on the if that's the case, two standard deviations. What is that? Two and a half percent. So this is like the high. This is near the end of the spectrum of being very relational. Yeah, yeah. Um, this one is 2.65 standard deviations away from the mean. So this is near the end of one one spectrum, and this is transactional, right? Several years of experience designing logos. I have web design experience incorporating HTML, PHP. Uh, uh, you get it, right? Accomplishments task within a week for a cost. This is about the work, right? Like, do you like this person? I, I'm not going to ask you to answer that. But, but anyway, so you, you get it, right? There, there's variation in how people are thinking about what makes them attractive to an, app, to a, to an employer. Um, even, I would say, in a relatively kind of bounded setting, right? I mean, this is like a task that's temporary and like it's on average about 300 bucks. OK, so who gets hired? All right, let's get to the point. All right, so uh, we ran um, a lot, a lot of regressions, but kind of the most stringent ones are what I was trying to explain to, to TJ and Aaron here. This is literally within every single job posting, right? Which is basically thus for the same job. People are vying for the same job. You can vary on what you write, who gets hired, given what they wrote, controlling for kind of all the observable skill levels, right? Price, star ratings, experience. Things like that. Okay. Any guesses? Relational. Relational. Okay. Okay. Um, hmm. Under what conditions? I, I know it's unfair, right? Because I'm just like saying under what conditions, and it could be anything. But but 
you know, you kind of get the website. You get how things work. Yeah. Do you have a certain minimum number of stars or references? Have you seen this before? Okay, well, forget it. Oh, okay, forget it. I shouldn't have called. See, this is like one of the classroom management techniques, not to call on someone that knows the answer. Right anyway. All right, let's get to it. So, if you have no past reputation, so basically, if you're a newbie on this platform, if you've like basically never worked, have never had any star ratings, right? Being relational hurts you. Right. Please, please give me a job. I'm really nice, and I mean, I, I know I don't have any work experience, but you know, I like you. That's kind of what that sounds like, I think. Right. So actually, being relational doesn't help you here if you have zero credibility. Okay. However, if you have average credibility or more, moderate to high reputation star ratings or level score, being relational helps you. Right. This is the, you know what, I got a resume to back this up. You can look at my star ratings and experiences. Let me tell you why I like you and why you should like me. Right? I can do this job. Right? Let's talk about other things. That's what we think we're seeing here. Okay. Right? This is interesting because you need to think a little bit about how this applies, not only because you're looking for jobs, but also how people look for jobs when they're applying with you. Right? How much credibility do you have? Yeah. So when you have a moderate to high reputation, mm -hmm. being transactional is worse off than somebody with... Yeah, why do you think that is? Why do you think that is? Or why do you think... I mean, I, I, we have, you know, we can speculate as well as this is anyone here. Well, I guess when you have moderate and high reputation, there's an expectation that are, they're not looking at that. That's, off, that's not being evaluated. I think so. I think so. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, so this is actually negative. It is negative. So if you have like a moderate to high reputation and you go in just talking about the job, it actually hurts you more than this other person right? without any reputation. Yeah. I guess you find the same results maybe with Airbnb listings and other kinds hmm. of, uh, um, kind of matching uh, platforms. Yeah, possibly. Um, it's interesting to think how much variation there is in there, you know, the likelihood of you kind of writing variation in, in Airbnb. I mean, they, if you notice, this is actually, so I know a couple of people that work at Airbnb and they do these experiments where, if you notice when you get on Airbnb, sometimes it prompts you to say, you know, talk about yourself or talk about why you're visiting, right? You, they, that, they vary those, they do A-B tests on those and they, do, they get outcomes on it. And so it does help in the Airbnb situation when you talk about yourself, like not about, I'll be there four days and pay you 200 bucks and I'm super clean, right? As opposed to, I'm really looking forward to staying in your place, you know, and, and finding out all the restaurants you talked about. I just gave you two very different examples of what you can write in, in a, you know, a span of like three sentences and it, and it actually affects who gets, um, uh, uh, Airbnb, yeah, who gets um, allowed to stay at the Airbnb settings. Yeah, Kelsey. If you look at a subset of this, this is, if they intersect in the middle, that's saying that someone with no past reputation and a transactional description is more likely to be uh, higher than someone with a good reputation who's more transactional. Yeah. That's true even within like a, within job. Within a job. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this would be the person that's. So. Like I would expect that line to be yeah. above the other one. So it'd be like I want someone yeah, no. that has a good yeah. reputation, and this is how I'm judging it. If not, then mm -hmm. I'll look for someone with no past. Reputation. Yeah, and I think that's what Manju was reacting because you imagine this line being at least above or equal, yeah. right? And we're not finding that's the case. Part of it is, of course, you can imagine no reputation doesn't mean you're bad. It just means they're not, they're not sure, right? And then having a moderate reputation could mean you're okay. So it's, it's not cut and dry how far apart they are in terms of ability. And then, again, on top of that, it's like this is the person being like, hey, I can do this in three weeks for 100 bucks. And you're like, I don't care. But this person's like, you know, I'm really looking forward to this project. It looks, it sounds exciting. And then I'm really, you know, I really want to make a, start up a reputation on this platform. So you can imagine it still being a trade-off somehow in the employer's mind. Right? Um, but there's more we can do, obviously. Okay. Performance. Yeah. Performance, come on. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, who are considered better employees? All right, okay, who wants to guess on this one? <laughs> Or should I just get to the punchline? Transactional. <laughs> You're still rooting for transactional, TJ? <laughs> okay. All right. So, um, no, this is interesting. So, no reputation. You actually want to be more relational. That's kind of scary because the implications for not having a reputation is really hard, right? Because kind of being hired 
it's you're, you're less likely to be hired, but you're if you are hired, you're actually more likely to be rated higher. So there's this kind of double wham. There's like catch twenty two for people with no reputation, and I think if you think about recruiting, <laughs> that's not a surprise, right? Like the people you get that have no kind of you know gold plated diploma or things like that. They, they it's tough, right? Because on one hand, you want them to prove they can do the job, but on the other hand, you still want to like someone that you hire, right? So there's this catch twenty two here, and we're seeing it here as well now. For the moderate to high reputation, it helps them as well. So it's positive. And uh, the, these lines are actually significantly different, which is interesting also. Um, but the whole point here is it's about being more repu re relational and, and, and we'll, we'll end up with higher rating scores. Now, there's a lot of things we can think about what that means, right? So again, we're controlling for ability. So these people are the ones that may be nicer, maybe willing to help out more, people like them more. There's a lot of things here that are going on. Yeah. You've got people who are like in the middle of the discussion that talk some transactional, some relational, and yeah, so I mean they are in here, right? Because if you think about um this measure of transactional relational, it's like this Gaussian distribution, so somewhere. Um and, and it literally I mean, we can figure out where it crosses over, but the the general idea is there are there are ends of the spectrum that are pulling these yeah apart. Yeah. And also up and down, of course. Yeah. Okay. So I'll just wrap up or... Okay, sure. So the job seeking interaction is basically, if you think about it as a, a person presenting themselves, then it's interesting to think about how you can do that and, 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 and what dimensions. We're going to say at, at some level it's about being relational versus transactional and clearly they both matter. And takeaways, right? This is literally about not for yourselves, thinking about how both of these matter. It's not just about your degree and your GPA and the class you've taken, the experiences. There's a lot of other things going on, as Don will attest to as well. And I don't ignore either of them. And then, then it becomes thinking about like what parts of your application can address each one. Right? It's like if you have the CV and the, the, the grades and the, and the, uh, you know, the, the uh, degrees, then you, you don't need to harp on that anymore. Maybe it's about building the relationship with an interview or not. Okay? Anyway, thank you. Great, thank you. Yeah.